Now, welcome everybody to this session. The structure of the session is that I'm going to briefly introduce our panel. We're going to show three short films and ask the panel for their views on the film and the questions that the film provokes for our sector and our future. And then we're going to ask you for any comments you have based on the questions and the films. And we're going to, we really have to change films every 20 minutes, else we won't get all three films in, and they're all very short. So I think it's time for the first film. I'll tell you about the film once we've watched it. Thank you. Could we have the first film, please? actually been here for the past two Fridays. I went a wee bit down and then I, was, I didn't want to go anywhere and I just wanted to stay in the house. But now that I've been out today and I've been here today, I'm feeling a bit better and I'll be a bit more confident again. It's a smashing picture, I really like that, it's really good, yeah. yeah. Um, this isn't quite finished yet. Well, it's a memory box. Nobody has seen it in my family. This is a letter written when I was first given the news that that was it. And I must have came home and I started writing a letter. Oh, this is a first haircut. I do have special birthday cards for Taras. I don't want to finish it. I don't want to take it home. When you're living with a long-term illness, you think, well, at least I can have time to say goodbye and do the things you want to do, whereas other people don't get that chance. But on the other hand, unfortunately, depression sets in because you're not doing your usual things. You're not, you know, working and, you know, Thank you. Some of you will have recognized that clip, which is from an amazing film made by the Scottish Documentary Indus, uh, Institute at Strathcarran Hospice in Scotland. Um, and the film is called Seven Songs for a Long Life and was featured strongly during Hospice Care Week. My panel at the far end is Maria McGill, who is Chief Executive of Children's Hospices across Scotland, Chaz. Dr. Jane Collins, Chief Executive of Marie Curie. And Jamie Johnston, who is lots of things. <laughs> Jamie knows an awful lot about film and helped to establish a film forum at the Hospice of St. Francis and also works in a pivotal way at the Children's Bereavement Co uh, sorry, Children's Bereavement Service at Great Ormond Street. So my first question for the panel, perhaps for you, Jane, is, is supporting children in a creative way before a death using memory boxes and day hospice, is it specialist or generalist work? And who's going to fund it in the future? A, a difficult question to answer. Um, Clearly, I'm sure all of us here would recognise the importance of pre-bereavement, particularly for children. And if one wants to look for evidence of the benefits of bereavement work, the greatest um, body of evidence is around children and young people. Um, 
not a huge amount, but nonetheless some evidence that it really does make a, a difference long term in terms of the mental health of those children and young people as they grow up. So I think as a community, we ought to be emphasising the importance of this. I think the distinction between specialist and generalist isn't necessarily very helpful. You could argue that as a child or young person, if your parent in particular dies, and, and may be true sometimes of grandparents, depending on the family setup, and certainly other siblings, if they were dying, this should be seen as something that's required and could be, determined, could be described as a specialist need. So I think that what we need to do probably more of is to build the body of evidence demonstrating the importance of developing this resilience for children and young people in particular, and to also, again, as a community, and we've got a number of routes of being able to do that, to encourage um, those who might um, have influence and also have money to ensure that this happens. I do think there's a lot that can be done without much money, though. And, and it's really about making sure that people know that these things can be of huge value. Uh, to those left behind, and that can be done through a whole variety of methods. I'd just like to add something on, though, which is this whole legacy issue is really important, and I'm embarrassed to say that I've only probably known for the last year this issue about you have to actually let Facebook know that you want your Facebook page closed down or not. Um, and, and have it put into a legacy position, apparently, on Facebook. And I've only known that about that for a year, and I just wonder how many people don't realise that there's an awkward situation. If you don't do it yourself, nobody else can do it. And um, that's another legacy issue that, of course, children and young people are perhaps left with um, having to deal with. Uh, Jane, we had a session yesterday run by James Norris. I don't know if James is still here, who's just set up the Digital Legacy Association, which gives fantastic guidance on how to manage Twitter, Facebook, and everything else digital after we die, and it's really important. Um, thank you. So more evidence needed. Jamie, I just wonder from the film point of view, what do you think about sad moving films in terms of influencing the public and funders? Do they work? Um, well, what strikes me about this uh, film in, in particular, or, or rather this clip, is the sort of element of... Uh, reflexivity in it and by that I mean that, um, that the filmmakers and I include the participants as well are exploring um, through film what a film can be and what it what it might mean and it struck me that this film belongs in the memory box with all the other um, items uh, right. there as a sort of a message to the to the future so it's, it's, it's as much for um, Julie and and Karis as, as uh, anybody else. So I, I realise that's not, that's not an, an answer to what you were asking, but just picking up on what Jane was saying about the um, sort of expense of it um, but, and the technology of it. But, um, and I, I don't mean to be unfair on people who haven't seen the rest of the film, but there are other elements uh, there where she's playing with her daughter as well, and it's, like a, it's a bit like a, a home uh, movie. And there's no reason why these sort of, these sort of uh, interactions and encounters with patients and their carers or people that they might be caring for can't be implemented um, uh, relatively cheaply and, 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 and as, a, as an intimate encounter of, of making a little film uh, with somebody. So um, it might be sad for um, viewers, but um, it seems an important part of pre-bereavement work for, for, the, for the patient and, and any family members. Thank you. As something that um, also could, could be imagined looking back on at a future time when um, you know, perhaps to this put life... the film in the memory box. Yeah. Um, I just remember a funder telling me um, she was happy to listen to all the stories, but don't make her cry because it didn't make her give money. So a message: mm. ask your funders what turns them on. Um, and Maria, just before we ask the audience for any comments. I just wonder how important creative work is with the children you're working with in the hospices in Scotland. Well, children engage with the world generally through play and having fun. And sometimes that's just about having fun, but sometimes that's about expressing difficult concepts, about saying they find their situation there in difficult. 
Uh, it's about writing messages for a mum and dad or for their brother or sister. So creative work is incredibly important and is actually central to all of what we do in CHAS. And we've just recently been working with the University of Highlands and Islands to help us understand the impact of that and how do we begin, how do you begin to evaluate creative therapies, or not just creative therapies, play. Mm. You know, how do you express to funders, whether they're statutory or voluntary, how do you say, this is incredibly important, this is a difference it makes, and here's how we've measured that, in a way that doesn't take away from the creativity and is actually part of that creative work and doesn't interrupt the creative process between the, the child and the, the activities coordinator or the nurse or whoever's engaging in that creative activity. But you talked about should, how important is it? Actually, we know, and Jane's been talking about the evidence of the importance of pre-bereavement work with children. If you take that even further down the line and we look at the at prisoners in particular, and in Scotland we have a young offenders institution for uh, offenders under the age of 25. 90% of those young offenders have experienced a significant bereavement or a traumatic or sudden death in their childhood. Now that's not the only reason they're there. But that's one of the reasons, and it seems to me a very significant reason why we as a community should, should really commit to making a difference to every child who's bereaved and not just leave it to specialists or generalists or educationalists or psychologists. Actually, as a community, we can make a difference. Thank you. You've heard the panel's views. We've got time for two or three comments, probably not for questions, but who wants to share anything that they're doing with us around creating memories? Because I think that's what palliative care does. Hello, uh, I'm Karen Brown from New Life Foundation for Disabled Children. I just wanted to echo the importance of pre-bereavement work. Um, we, we're aware that through um, providing specialist toys to empower families to be able to um, help children understand their feelings is very important. Um, but we've also recently launched our Comfort Capsule Service, which is um, a, a collection of resources to help um, families to um, build and treasure memories at the end of a child's life. Um, and it's uh, the feedback that we've had to date um, shows that, um, that actually bringing the whole family together in recognition of um, the important time that they have while they have it uh, is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see any other comments? Okay, it's difficult to see from here. Short comments, please, because we're moving on to the next can film in a minute. Can I Thank just you. clarify the context of the film you've seen? I'm from Strathcarran Hospice. That is an extract of an 82-minute documentary. We've shown it in 100 venues across the UK. It was shown on BBC Two Scotland to an audience of about a third of a million people. And it has moments in it that are laugh out loud and just completely funny. So it's not the film that you see from that. Um, the work that that filmmaker did involved um, working with patients and helping them make their own film. Mm. And in fact, the film that Julie made with her daughter was just solid fun. They just filmed it themselves on dodgems, um, dancing, just generally having fun. And so the whole purpose of this was to give people um, the knowledge to do editing and to make their own film and to create their own memories. Most of the children have filmed their parents doing very, very ordinary things, helping them with the homework, baking, using hair straighteners. They've not gone for special things. Thanks, Irene. Mm. And the film is still available to watch on BBC iPlayer, I think, for another couple of weeks. So do watch it if you want to watch the whole film. And the other question we haven't got time to answer now, but to think about, 
It's about the challenge of filming in a hospice or in a palliative care unit, because we get constant requests at Hospice UK from film companies saying, tell us a hospice where we can go and do some filming. So speak to Strathcarran about the experience. So can we have the next film, please? As a society, we don't need to have bad deaths uh, because that's inhumane. But they do occur. And the residual effect of a bad death on a family is, is, is really, really difficult. Uh, to allow somebody to die in pain when it's not necessary, uh, that's, that's a tragedy. If one man in a family suffers agonizing pain, it's the whole family which suffers from it. Everything in the family is now concentrated on relieving that person's suffering. If you don't treat pain, then you, I mean, patients are not able to live their day-to-day -day lives. They can't go to work, like I said, and if they're the main uh, breadwinners in the family, they are not able to do that. And even they can't socialize with their friends, they can't sit with their family, many things just go wrong. People don't go to work. It destroys families. So, I mean, that, you know, think of the amount of money and that, that would be saved in the workforce and how much better off families and relationships would be if they weren't impacted by untreated pain. The consequences, of course, sometimes, unfortunately, would be destruction of the family socially. The children's education stops, the family cow is sold first, then the home is lost, and everything is sold so that they can relieve this man's pain or suffering. We have clear evidence in developed countries that untreated pain has actually a cost impact on society. To me, the critical issue, the cost of pain, is the personal suffering it inflicts. We have the means to treat uh, pain uh, with us today. We have the drugs, we have the techniques. Uh, so, you know, we shouldn't... It, it's actually needless, it le needless suffering. If you don't treat pain, there are people who are suffering needlessly. A month back, I treated a man, not with cancer, with a peripheral vascular disease. He came to us and he had this large black scar around his neck. The pain was so intolerable that he tried to hang himself. <clears throat> and his two children, around 12 or 8, saw this, came running, lifted him up, thereby keeping him alive. Now, how much of scars will be there on those two kids' lives, their souls? So, I would have loved to say that that was a problem in the past, but as recently as two years back, many cities in the country still had interruptions of morphine. Suffering from, from severe cancer pain or pain related to HIV can be really, really extreme. We've had multiple people tell us that they would prefer to die rather than having to face the, the pain that they were suffering. On top of that, pain can be treated with very inexpensive medications that are generally not very hard to administer. Um, so there's really no reason why any patient should have to suffer from pain. We have the medications, we have the knowledge, it's not difficult for doctors or even nurses to, to treat pain, and yet in many countries, um, pain treatment is very poorly available and millions of people suffer. is a short film from a website that I um, would recommend to you called Life Before Death. It has 43 short films talking about access to opioids around the world. Um, they can all be used for teaching purposes and for advocacy. Um, the UK came top of the world recently in a poll run by the Economist Intelligence Unit. So we're top of the world for palliative care. I know some of us have challenged that, but I wonder, Jane, what you think, what's our responsibility as a hospice sector or a palliative care movement to the rest of the world if we are number one? Well, I was re reflecting on the question uh, watching the film and recognised that um, at Marie Curie, we aren't advocating 
on behalf of people in those countries, you know, to be brutally frank. And uh, when one really thinks about it properly, I'm ashamed of that. There are some fantastic people, though, including some, I think, in the audience today, who have been doing work in this area over a number of years. Uh, Scott Murray, St. Christopher's, a whole... I don't want to name all the ones that I'm aware of. And again, I just wonder whether, as a body, as a community, we could think about whether this could be our challenge. Because we do have quite a number of roots of how we might be able to influence in terms of some of the overseas development uh, funding that the UK gives out, for example, um, in terms of sharing some of our education and training um, facilities um, and, and um, products, if you like. Um, but there is also, I think, my understanding, which may be wrong, is that there is still, uh, despite what the Dutch um, academic was saying, there is still a deep disquiet, particularly of using opioids in many countries. I mean, we suffer from that, don't we, in the UK, in terms of prison population. Uh, it's very difficult to give opioids in prisons. Um, so there are quite a lot of things to overcome. It may be that this is the moment to try and get behind doing something about it, and uh, that's what I will reflect on, having seen this film. Conferences are always a good place to start. Um, I suppose as a doctor, I just know how easy it is to treat some of the pain we've seen in some of these films, um, and as a movement, I hope we can advocate more, but also perhaps using whoever was here yesterday morning to hear Professor Watson talk about Zoom technology, how we can share our knowledge, I'm not going to say specialist knowledge, how we can share our knowledge with the wider world and have shared multidisciplinary team meetings, but also the advocacy needed at government level to share the stories of untreated pain. Um, Maria, do you see much untreated pain in children? Um. Not in your hospices, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure not. I think probably yes. I think there is a reluctance, an even greater reluctance, to use uh, opioids with children uh, for professionals who are out with children's hospices. It's not an easy thing to do. It involves complicated uh, calculations, but it requires a, a shift in thinking for the professional that perhaps the, the care for this child has changed. And, and also a complicated conversation, potentially, as, as a professional might see it with a family and a child, about, about this medicine, which in our community, if you mention morphine, uh, people have a, per, a preconceived idea about what that means. And so that can be difficult to explain to a parent or, or to a child. But when I watched that film, I was just so humbled. You know, we may have been found to be number one uh, in the world. I um, think perhaps we have a bit more to go than that. And we have so much money, so much money. And, and yet there are countries out there who don't have anything like we have and are doing, are delivering care in a really innovative way. But I think if we are to help, it's about understanding from uh, countries what would make a difference. Advocacy, yes, I can see that. But actually working with individual countries, what would make a difference? What can we do? Asking that question that we ask our, um, the person in front of us, what matters most to you right now? What would make a difference? And I guess the flip side of that is what can we learn from countries who use very inventive, creative ways to reach huge populations without the resources that we have? Um, it's very striking that something like 80% of the world's morphine is produced in India, but they have very, very poor access to morphine. And yet one teaspoon of that powder you saw could treat severe pain. Um, you saw Dr. Raja Gopal, who told the story of the man who tried to hang himself. He is the Sisley Saunders of India, and he's worth looking up on YouTube. Jamie, when often on television, on Comic Relief Day or Sports Relief, we see films of terrible suffering in other countries, and it makes people give money. Do you mm. think, what do you think about showing films like this to spread the message of untreated pain? Um, I was conscious uh, coming to this that this 
hasn't been something I've talked about as much as I should. So I'm going to sort of refer to a couple of um, works by Susan Sontag called uh, Regarding the Pain of Others and on photography, where she talks about um, the, the possible effects of film and uh, photographs of, of people suffering. And, uh, and sh she finds it problematic, not because of anything like uh, um, compassion fatigue or desensitizing, but rather that it, the films can evoke sympathy, but if it, if it just leaves us with sympathy and, and, not, um, and that doesn't transform into the sort of action that uh, Jane, Jane was mentioning, then they perhaps aren't achieving what, what they hoped to achieve by it. And, and there might be in our sympathy a certain sense of uh, we, we're not accomplices in, in what is happening there and um, sort of perhaps polarizing the, the we's and, and the they's and, and being left with a certain sort of passivity. So um, I think the, the films by themselves aren't Eve, despite being uh, graphic, aren't, aren't these sort of unmediated, sort of plugging in directly to the truth of, of, the, of the situation. And uh, for, the, for viewers, and also for filmmakers, uh, there's a very powerful um, quote where she says, the camera makes everybody a tourist in other people's reality, and eventually in one's own. And, uh, Can I'm, you say that again, the, the camera? The camera makes everybody a tourist in other people's reality and eventually in one's own. And uh, I think it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like if, if somebody's in distress that you don't know, the, the inclination might be to sort of hug them. But unfortunately, no, no, no matter how well-meaning that is, that um, doesn't guarantee how it's received. And uh, I'm very sort of struck by the two examples of the relatives by the bedside um, gazing directly at the camera. Yeah. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't get a sense that there, there's any sort of relief that you know, the, this, this terrible suffering is going to be alleviated in any way by being sort of filmed by somebody and sort of shipped back to some other country for, for, for viewing. So um, that's not to say that film doesn't have its, uh, its place. And I think it's been sensitively done in this film by um, uh, being used sparingly and with, with um, informed commentary uh, as, as well. But um, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a problem of thinking that you, you can just show films to somebody and, and that's, going to, that's going to sort of transform into action. Um, transforming into action. I remember being taught by a fundraiser I worked with, the framework of AIDA, that there's awareness, there's interest, you have to then shift to desire, and then you have to shift to action. So we need to think about filmmakers who can shift from awareness of untreated pain into action and perhaps advocacy. Thank you. I'd like to ask the audience whether there are any examples of working with resource-poor countries, either supporting or learning from them. And I can't see anybody, anything here. Right, Peter. Chief Executive of uh, Richard House Children's Hospice. We've been twinned with um, the Belarusian Children's Hospice Service for around mm, eight to ten years now, and um, it's really challenging. But um, it was uh, an approach that was advocated by Hospice UK, um, the twinning methodology um, of putting a resource poor country with a, a, a hospice service in this country. I think it can be effective, but you have to really manage expectations. Um, and what I've found is over the years we've been doing it, we've been trying to exchange staff because there was absolutely learning to be achieved both ways. But one of the ways I wanted to get involved was more strategically. So I sit on their advisory council to help them think how they want to develop the services there. But I have to say, uh, we can learn an awful lot from them because um, there's a small group in this country you know, around a Catholic church in Amersham that effectively raises the, and it's five people, and they fundraise for the total hospice salary bill. Um, and it's just amazing. And um, you just realize what can be achieved with relatively a small amount of money. Um, but you have to have people there who are particularly passionate to be able to do it. Thank you. And of course, there's the example which we've heard of several times during this conference about the community volunteering in Kerala and how we can learn from there risk-free models. Um, I just 
one of the things that, that I've learned about the hospice is how I make assumptions, how we make assumptions around need. And I remember me being absolutely furious about what we throw away, including the drugs that we get rid of when they come back and stuff. And um, I met this wonderful woman from Rwanda who was running a hospice single-handedly, doing most of the stuff herself. And the way she got volunteers in was to feed them lunch. And she, they did everything. And I had made this assumption around, well, you know, about pain around, well, can you not give morphine? And she said, well, I share one forty sit between seven people. And if I was to give them morphine, what do I drop? Because we have no money. And she was very frustrated because they had recently, the government had recently been shipped over a whole load of, of diamorphine, which had to be actually destroyed because it was past its survey day. And they had to use some of their very limited resources to pay for it to be destroyed. So we can make assumptions around, you know, it's easy, we just send all of our stuff over, but I think it's about maybe supporting people in a way that they can work with what they have and looking at what they need from us rather than just making assumptions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think about four years ago at this conference, um, I reported on an audit where we calculated the cost of drugs we had destroyed in um, a medium-sized hospice in a year. It was £24,000 worth of drugs um, had to be destroyed because of um, controlled drug regulations. And that would have served, that would have supported the pain in a whole town in India. At the time, the health secretary, Andrew Lansley, said he wanted to know more and were the regulations was it possible to change the regulations, but nothing has happened. Uh, but I know that our nurses in our hospice hated destroying morphine when you see a film like that. So maybe another area we could work together on. I don't know if there's any pharmacists in the room, but don't throw a tomato. But, um, we're going to move on to the last film. I hope these films will... Sorry. Uh, I'm Steve Jackson, I'm the Chief Executive of Mary Stevens Hospice in Stourbridge, which is in the West Midlands. Uh, rather bizarrely, my story's about Rwanda. Um, we have, but by pure accident and serendipity, become involved um, through one of our doctors visiting Rwanda with the hospice in Rwanda, and our pharmacist and doctor have just spent um, a bit over a week in Rwanda training uh, doctors and pharmacists um, in the use of morphine um, and dispelling uh, many of the myths uh, and misunderstandings about long-term use of uh, opioids. And um, they're now manufacturing morphine in Rwanda and we seem to have become the government's advisors on, um, on the use of opioids. Brilliant. I hope you're going to write that up for us, Steve. Uh, it's been written up for the European Journal of Palliative Care Right. Um, but we'll give it to you as well. Thank you. We're in our last 20 minutes. We're going to move on to our last film now. I wonder if we could have the lights down.
I've watched that film hundreds of times and it always um, gets to me and I'm sure it's got to some of you. Um, it's made by the Cleveland Clinic, who are an extraordinary, very wealthy, top American medical center. And it's made with actors. There's three questions I want to ask about this film, and I'd like you all to think about them, even though we may not have time to hear from you all. One, can we teach empathy? Two, do films need words? And three, how can we inject empathy into all of the settings where people die? Care home, hospital, home, hospice. So, Jamie, do films need words? Um, or verbal? Well, yes, we had words. Well, I was just about to say that. It's interesting that um, this does have words, and, well, it has text um, on it. And... Uh, Part, uh, it's interesting that you said they were all actors because we, in a way we don't know, but, uh, but, you've, but uh, anyway. Um, so it does, ha it does have text, and um, as regards empathy, what's interesting about it is the way it's done, that um, we have a brief first impression of all the characters, and then where um, the film discloses in the third person something about them. And, um, and my reaction to it is that you immediately taking that piece of information as a, as a thread and being quite imaginatively curious about their lives and, and drawing on that. So, um, so it's not really answering whether films need words or not, but it's, it's, it's sort of talking about the charm of the film uh, for me. And, and that information is something that you could learn from these, um, there are actors here, but from, from patients. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, interestingly, there was the lives behind the roles of the doctors and carers as well. Um, these are things that you could find out about somebody in an empathic engagement with them where you're, um, you have an imaginative curiosity in, in their lives. So um, I don't, so, so the words were doing what, what a question could have done or, or an encounter with, could have done uh, with these with these people so um, thank you um, and of course there was music there too which somehow seems the perfect soundtrack um, Maria you've run a hospice before and now you're running children's hospices um, do you think we can teach empathy well <clears throat> for me empathy is a, a physical response and I had a very physical response to that film. <laughs> David Pearl would have told us that's called a feeling. <laughs> visceral feeling, uh, or a visceral response. Can you teach empathy? Well, if you consider empathy to be a skill or an ability, you could say you can teach empathy. Empathy is a, um, there are neuro, there's neuroscientific evidence to say there is a physical response. And sometimes uh, learning a skill and an ability can take you on a route to experiencing something much deeper. So you could. But I wonder if it's about, if you take it to be this ex physical experience, helping us all reconnect with who we are as people and reminding ourselves that we are human and the people that we are around are human. And you talked about, can we inject empathy into every setting where people die? Actually, it's about every single interaction we have with people. The person who was helping us at breakfast, the person who was checking us out, the taxi driver, every single person we meet has a story. And I think that's about just recognizing that we're all people and human. So I like Jamie's term, imaginative curiosity mm -hmm. and I was hearing from somebody who trains doctors in communicating better that some senior doctors actually this is in South Africa have lost the ability to have small talk with patients <laughs> so you know in our infection controlled environments you often can't have photographs by the bed but there's always something you can talk about to try and get quickly into a patient or a family's world and often we don't have much time so I think we need to get better at picking up those cues because empathy is getting into somebody else's world and Jane last word before we 
talk to the audience about teaching empathy, injecting empathy? I think that teaching empathy is possible, uh, but I think we ought to also, in the caring areas, try to make sure we recruit people who've got some empathy already. How and, do you do that? Well, there are ways of judging that. Um, and we had a programme at Great Ormond Street when we were recruiting nurses for training, testing out some of that empath empathetic um, ability and caring ability. So there are some tools that you can use to try and recruit, and we're going to be using those at Marie Curie. From the point of view of getting into every setting, um, I suppose I just want to build on what Maria said. And I think the comment just right at the end of a film said it all to me, which is about work, walking in other people's shoes. And I think there's a, a tendency and a temptation for professions to be professional. We were talking about it before this session, actually. And therefore, feeling that they've got to create some sort of barrier, partly to protect themselves, but partly because they feel that's what's expected of them. And we were just discussing, um, both having had a clinical background, that you can still be professional because you're not feeling the same pain as the person you're talking to, but nonetheless you can reach out on a human level. And that's because you think to an extent, how would you feel if you were in that position? So that walking in other people's shoes really seems to sum up to me how we should be delivering care in all settings. I mean, Carl Rogers added the qualification as if walking in people's shoes without um, losing sight of the as if. As and if. That's, and mm. that's why I think of it as imaginative uh, yeah. um, curiosity mm -hmm. in, in, in somebody else. But um, he also believed that um, empathy could be developed. And, and he believed that in developing himself, he um, developed um, empathy. And, uh, and I wonder if that's not just... Um, through certain types of encounters with uh, people, everyday situations and everyday people, but uh, taking an interest in, in human activities such as creativity and art and, dare I say, filmmaking. So, um, yes, and I remember sometimes when we had ethical conflicts where the team didn't agree about something that was a decision that was being made in the hospice about a patient's care, you can use the technique of empathetic imagination where suddenly the doctor becomes a nurse, the nurse becomes the patient, and the physio becomes the patient's mother. And if you actually start to get into the role of somebody else, you start to see the problem through somebody else's eyes and it brings people closer together. But it's tricky. And I think part of the playfulness of the film is that it, it invites us to do a bit of empathy with fictional characters, mm -hmm. as if to say, yes, see, you, can, you, can, you can do it. And uh, when I first saw it, I thought it, wouldn't, it would be interesting if you had the film without the text. And I, my guess is that many of us would make a good guess at uh, what, was going what, on. what was going on. And, and also when you get the hang of the film, um, the, the two gentlemen on the escalator, and it says... Um, uh, tumour is benign and then there's the second person sort of tapping the uh, anxiously tapping and you feel you know what the next piece of text is going to be so you're sort of exercising your imagination uh, it took there. a year to make that film mm. Mm. and i'm sure many thousands of dollars there have been uk equivalents made by some trusts but i'm afraid they're not quite as good <gasps> did i say that um what would anybody else like to say about empathy Hello, Moira Wellam, St Nicholas Hospice Care. I have to say, I really hated that. Um, and to be honest, it felt a bit like a really bad injury lawyer advert. <laughs> um, and I think the reason why I hated it so much is because I think to actually become empathetic, you really have to know more about yourself and more about others. And I think the issue for me was, one, it was actors, and it was obviously actors, and to the fact that actually an assumption was made that someone who got a benign diagnosis would actually be really happy about that. And you assume they would, but until you ask the individual, you can't really predict how they're going to react. Mm. So, um, yeah, I yeah, really no. like it. And interestingly, <laughs> Yibby's song, Yesterday, that created a response in me because it was a real person with a real song with a real story. So right. this really just 
didn't work for me, sorry. That's fine, we said these films are to provoke and challenge, and I suppose what you've demonstrated is that we all need different channels to, to move us. Um, I guess I have spoken to the person who made this film, and it, was, it wasn't particularly about sparking empathy, it was about saying there's a very diverse population in the hospital and we've got to notice everybody and they've all got a story. It was as simple as that. And they could have all had many stories. Okay. Um, recruiting is one thing, maintaining is another. Yeah. And I think we've got to kick out this whole thing about recruiting in a very euphemistic term. You have to think about the context in which people are working. And Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning, we can completely apply to our acute and our health economy. He wrote about the concentration camp yeah. and how he survived and others didn't. And it was all about survival. Mm. And we have colleagues in the acute sector who are trying to survive. Mm. And we know that from our own colleagues. We've all been there, we're all trying to still support them. So I think this whole thing about, and even Dr. Bewey talked about how the F1s and F2s, who are the junior doctors, they come in as our junior student nurses do. And they are delighted and privileged after all those years of training to care. And by year three, they've lost it. And that is our real crisis. We are losing the caring. And caring is such a, an underrated term. We need to think about critical caring, curiosity in caring, constructively caring, and get our nurse consultants and all our other nursing professions to really raise the bar and all our other AAPs and our physicians to say, we want to do better than this. We don't want to just survive. And I just see all this survival going on. And that survivorship term is a crap way to live, let me tell you. When I turn up in the morning and someone says, how are you? And I say, I'm surviving. I don't think that's a good way to live. And I just think our colleagues are just about surviving, as many of us are in different ways. So let's start looking after ourselves. Let's ask, ask what are the needs that we have. We need to think about our patients, but we also need to think about our own resilience. And we did work on this at Hospice UK, as you know, with point of care. I hope you've all read it and really attended to that and thinking out with your services about your colleagues who are dying in the community, our DNs, and I know you all know this, but we've got to find a way through this and together, collaboratively, another C to add to those six poor Cs that we are encumbered with. Um, let's do some proper C work. And I've got some Cs that I'd like to share with you at some point if you're ready for it. Thank you. Thank you. you. That's <laughs> probably... <laughs> Can I just come in and say that Maria and I were also talking about that other side of burnout, mm -hmm. uh, but, but focusing on the empathy part as well. So uh, we absolutely accept that burnout, and it's a big issue. It is, and I think getting to know your colleagues and their stories is part of that, and finding a way to do it. Um, doing somebody else's job for half a day or even an hour starts to understand the pressures that they're under. So placements of hospice nurses in hospitals, hospital nurses in hospices. If you understand each other's role, you tolerate and you understand the pressures and it's much easier to collaborate once you understand somebody's values and context. Empathy. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, my name's Andrew Thorns. I'm a, a consultant in Pilgrim's Hospice in Kent and a connected advanced communication skills facilitator. I can't really follow that last comment. I haven't quite got the passion. I think I was quite right. And we know that if we don't address our own feelings, then we can't address the feelings of the people we're looking after. I think empathy, in my experience, is a quality. And I think you can improve people's levels of empathy. But I think there are naturally empathic people and people mm -hmm. who perhaps aren't. And what we see in the communication skills training with sort of role play, with actors playing those roles, is that people may be thinking empathically, but fail to demonstrate it. And that's where the skill says, unless you speak your empathy or demonstrate your empathy, then it doesn't work. And I think it's just a real shame, therefore, the funding's been taken away from the connected advanced communication skills, because that has proven to actually improve yeah. people's communication, improve those skills, and probably prevent some of the burnout and some of the, the lack of compassion that we see. Thank you. Can I just, I just want to say I'm Laura Lifton Green, I'm an educator at Bradford. I can't um, see where you are, Laura. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm here, so I, I reacted a little bit to the um, mandate to teach empathy um, with a lecture theatre full of 180 nursing students um, and have the f um, pervasive feeling that a lot of the time we're being expected to equip nurses to function in quite a dysfunctional um, world. And so for me, 
the idea of values-based recruitment is really limited, it's really lacking in evidence base at the moment. Um, and what we're actually seeing, what I'm seeing when students are coming back to me from placement is the impossibility of taking action. And the problem, I think, is that actually if you encourage empathy without giving people the equipment to act, then that's the path to burnout, that's the path to compassion fatigue, because you're opening them up to a world of pain and a world of witnessing suffering that they have nothing to do with. And as often is the case, it's people who are on the um, shop floor, it's the nursing staff who are receiving the blame um, and uh, receiving the accusations of lacking compassion, uh, when sometimes not feeling can be the only way to survive. So I'm echoing very much what Marie was saying, but I just wanted to add in sort of Great. educators perspective. Yes, so empathy without the ability to act is actually dangerous. So I've got a speaker at each microphone, number two. Uh, yeah, John Wilson from St Catherine's Hospice in Scarborough. I'm a counsellor and a trainer and I do teach, um, do try to teach people, uh, doctors, nurses, volunteers, counsellors, social workers, uh, to, to teach empathy. I'd agree with what people have said really, that um, most people in this kind of field have a natural empathy, otherwise they wouldn't work in it. But um, I just wanted to agree with the speaker before last, he, he said what I was going to say. Um, you can be as empathic as you like, if you can't communicate it to others, it's really not much use to anybody. Thank you. Hmm. Hello. Hi, I'm Maggie Keeble. I'm um, a GP from Worcester. Um, and I see a lot of care going on in care homes. <clears throat> um, two um, quick routes to connecting with patients. Um, some of you may be aware of them, they're out there on the internet um, and are very, very simple um, tools. One is a face to a name campaign um, kicked off by a lady called Giovanna Forte, whose mother with dementia was in an acute hospital um, and not having the sort of quality of care that she would have hoped for her mother. She took a photograph in of her mother in her prime, beautiful photograph, and it completely changed the attitude of the staff looking after her. Okay. The other is a um, Helen Anderson and her one-page profile. It's about summarizing um, who, who you are as a person, um, or again, being very useful with people with dementia, what they have done in their lives, what is important to them, and what the staff can do to make life better for them. That can be done on one side of A4. You made the comment, Ros, about not having photographs by the bed, but I think in any healthcare environment, you get laminated A4 bits of paper, you laminate a photograph with the one-page profile on the back, and you make sure the staff looking after that person read that, and I think that's a very shortcut to actually enabling people to make that personal connection. And once you've made that connection, empathy does follow for most people. Thank you, and that's a, a great place to stop. Um, if you want to hear more from Maggie, she's um, contributing to the frailty session this afternoon, which should be great. Um, cartoons are involved, I think, as well. Um, yes, we heard from Helen Sanderson earlier in the conference about one-page profiles, so her presentation is on the website. So I'd like to, can we thank our panel, first of all?